everybody who might be tuning in. This is State Senator Mallory McMorrow for a not usually at a regular scheduled time live stream. Uh, a few of you have been reaching out and asking when the next one is. And typically we do these live streams every week that the Senate is in session. Uh, but it has been a big election year and there have not been all that many session days, but we had one of our remaining session days this week and figured we wanted to hop in, update everybody on what's going on and also just kind of walk you through what happened in the election, what this time period means and where we go from here. Uh, so for anybody who uh, may be tuning in for the first time, hi, I'm State Senator Mallory McMorrow. This is our regular live stream, uh, and we are trying to add LinkedIn to the mix. So if you are tuning in on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, hello. Uh, we are going to run you through an update from the state, update from the Capitol, and also potentially uh, open it up to Q&A especially right now where people may have questions about what redistricting means or what the election means or where we go from here. So no matter what platform you are on, the way to ask a question is to go ahead and type it into the comment section of that platform. Please make sure to include your full name if it is not uh, obvious from your user handle and also what city you live in so we can make sure that we are answering constituent questions first. Right off the bat, I uh, wanted to provide an update from the federal level on student loan debt relief program. Uh, we had posted links about this on our social channels to uh, make sure you knew how to apply for the federal student loan debt relief program. And many of you did that. Many of you turned in applications. We know that this is going to be a huge relief for people who need student loan debt relief, uh, especially those of us who are kind of in my generation or younger who maybe graduated into the last recession, uh, still haven't fully caught up and really that debt relief would help you fully participate, buy a home, you know, whatever it is you want to do. Um, since it was announced, uh, there have been some updates and changes that you may have heard about in the news that we want to update you on. There have been a few court challenges to the program and two have caused a pause on the rollout of the student debt relief program. A Texas judge invalidated the program, claiming that the executive branch does not have this power. And another case came out of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit back in October. And six states joined the case, arguing that they were harmed by the freeze in student loan repayments. A three-judge panel unanimously decided that the program should be paused until further notice or by action by the U.S. Supreme Court. The Biden administration has taken action against both of these cases, um, challenging that they are firmly in the right to uh, execute this program. And uh, so more to come. I know it's frustrating, especially for anybody who has applied and was really banking on this student loan debt relief to come through. Uh, but the Biden administration has recently announced that they will extend the pause on student loan repayments until June 30th of next year uh, to allow, hopefully, the Supreme Court to take this up and rule on it affirmatively. <coughs> also of note, if you have applied... The Department of Education will hold on to information for the 26 million Americans who have already considered and applied for student debt relief, 16 million um, of whom have already been approved. So if you've already applied, don't worry about having to apply again. They're going to hold on to your information uh, so that hopefully when this gets resolved, you will be uh, back in the queue where you started and good to go. All right, next up, shifting gears to what happened in Michigan. So we had an election, our midterm election, and this year we had all of the top offices, governor, secretary of state, attorney general, as well as the entire state legislature. So everybody in the state house and the state senate was up for election. Uh, and now for the first time in nearly 40 years, uh, Democrats starting in January, will control both the state House and the state Senate. So there is a Democratic trifecta that was the result of this year's elections in the Senate. There will be a 20 Democrats to 18 Republicans majority. In the state House, it will be 56 Democrats and 54 Republicans. So pretty evenly split. It's still um, a fairly bipartisan legislature. But one thing that I do want to note is this was the first election 
that was facilitated after Michiganders voted to create the Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission in 2018. So uh, previously, our legislative maps were some of the most gerrymandered in the country. And over the past few cycles, believe it or not, Democrats narrowly um, had more votes for state house and state senate in total. Um, but Republicans still held majorities in both chambers due to the legislative maps. Uh, so with this, you actually see the makeup of the chambers accurately reflect the vote totals statewide. What a concept. So we are heading into a Democratic majority uh, starting in January. The new Senate majority leader will be Winnie Brinks, who uh, will be the first woman Senate majority leader in state history. She hails out of Grand Rapids. And in addition to this, this is pretty exciting. Women will make up a majority of representation in the Democratic caucuses in both the state house and the state Senate. So yes, we're getting there, women. Overall, women now make up 41% of lawmakers in the legislature in total, getting that much closer to accurate representation of all of the women who live in Michigan. Uh, women make up 50.4% of the population. So we are making gains, really exciting. Uh, also, we have a record number of incoming legislators who are LGBTQ which is great. So our caucuses are diversifying and we are truly um, working towards a legislature that is accurately representative of the people of Michigan. So that is incredibly exciting. Over in the House, the new Speaker of the House will be Joe Tate, which will be Michigan's first ever Black Speaker of the House. And he hails out of Detroit. He and I came in together uh, in our respective chambers in 2018, and he is just a fantastic person. I'm really, really excited for incoming Speaker Tate. Uh, and over in the Senate, as I mentioned, Winnie Brinks will be our majority leader. Uh, and I have also been um, appointed to serve in a leadership role as the majority whip. So uh, it is a, really a critical role to kind of shepherd the agenda forward, to stay in touch with all of the members in our caucus, make sure we're kind of checking in, seeing how everybody's voting and that we can move our agenda forward together as a united cohesive caucus and work on behalf of everybody who trusted us to take these roles. So just exciting, exciting days ahead. So what does that mean? We had elections. Does that mean everything changed overnight? No, it does not. So one thing to be clear is until the end of the year, until December 31st, your current legislator, the person that you've had serving you for the past two or four years is still your state legislator. So you may have seen on our Facebook page, for example, that we had been sharing some resources out of Oakland County. And if you are wondering why are we only including Oakland County, uh, we are still representing the 13th district through the end of the year. Uh, starting January 1st, that is when the new districts take effect and we will be now represent the new 8th Senate District, which includes Oakland County and a significant portion of the city of Detroit. So if you have any questions, concerns, comments, you need to reach out to your legislator, make sure you are reaching out to your current legislator. And we will make sure to drop a link in our comments on the Facebook page, if you're not sure what district that is, that you can look it up. Um, and just be aware that we are all, the entire legislature, going through a transition process right now in terms of closing out the current term closing out our current offices and transitioning into the new year, into new offices, new staff, all of the above. So be patient with us. We are all uh, in the transition phase right now. So you may be asking, well, if the districts have changed and they haven't gone into effect yet, what the heck are you doing in Lansing? We are in a period that is known as lame duck. Lame duck session is the period that occurs after the election but before the term turns over and the new legislators take over. Uh, it's called lame duck because these are legislators who are still in office. Some of them may have been voted out of office. Some of them, may, districts have changed. Uh, this can sometimes be a very chaotic time where you'll see a lot of overnight sessions. You'll see a lot of pushes because this is really the last hurrah, especially for outgoing legislators to be able to get their bills through. Um, however, this year, it's a pretty quiet lame duck, which is why you haven't seen very many of these live streams. 
Uh, so some people have criticized lame duck sessions since one could reasonably make the argument that legislators not returning the next section are no longer accountable to their voters. And people have been advocating for the elimination of lame duck session altogether. Uh, that is something that on its face, I would support. Uh, I think that it's really hard to be pushing bills through when you're not actually accountable to any voters. And it's sort of this weird nebulous time where we've seen a lot of bad stuff happen in the past. So uh, I kind of align with with that point of view. Um, but what is true is the majority party controls session, agenda, calendars, what wills move. So right now that's still the Republican Party. They control both the Senate and the House. Um, and especially now that we've seen um, a new majority will be taking over in the new year, We've seen a pretty quiet lame duck, which makes sense. You know, if you're going to be running bills that the governor may not sign, if they are not necessarily popular with the governor, uh, you can see why a lot of members may not even try to run them because they're not going to get signed. Uh, it's it's not <laughs> kind of worth pushing for. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, just so you know what to expect, we have a couple of tentative days left in session on our calendar, uh, one next Tuesday. We're not sure whether or not we're going to have any days after that. Uh, that is, again, up to the majority party to decide, but that may potentially be one of, if not our last session day of the year. And then our office will be focused, as we mentioned, on the shutdown, closing down our existing office, and then starting the transition into representing the new 8th Senate District uh, and physically moving into a new office, our office in Lansing. It's going to be a big move. We are moving from one office to the office next door. Ooh, it's going to be tough, but we're going to work on it together. Um, okay, so we did have session this week. We had an eight-hour session day, and there were some bills that moved that I wanted to highlight for you. Senate Bill 1207 will move Michigan's presidential primary to February instead of March. This was a bipartisan bill. It was authored by Senator Wayne Schmidt, a Republican from Traverse City, and it moved out of the Senate and is on its way to the state house. Senate Bill 783 and 1082 would maintain the, maintain the same level of tax relief for 100% disabled veterans and would transform the benefit from a property tax exemption into an income tax credit for the ease of burden on local governments. The process for eligible veterans to claim the credit would remain the same, while cities, villages, townships, and counties would get much needed financial relief from the state. Another big package, this one has want, been one that has been worked on for years. Senate bills 223 through 227 would aim to prevent sexual assault by fixing loopholes in Michigan law, like those that enabled Larry Nassar to prey on children and young women for decades. Specifically, these bills would do the following. One, require school districts to disseminate age-appropriate education material developed by the Michigan Department of Education related to sexual assault and harassment and available resources within the community. Two, prohibit sexual contact and penetration under the pretext of medical treatment and prescribe penalties. Uh, three, modify sentencing guidelines for sexual contact or sexual penetration under the pretext of medical treatment and create guidelines for when a licensee or a registrant could and could not perform medical treatment on a minor that involves vaginal or anal penetration unless it is within the licensee's or registrant's practice and require another licensee and the minor's parents or guardians to give consent and modify sentencing guidelines as well. So as I mentioned, this has been a bill package that is deeply necessary uh you know i think for for everybody who suffered under the the watch of larry nassar and and the impact that we've seen this is a long time coming i'm very very grateful to my colleagues including senator sang and senator erica geis who worked on this bill package and was proud to vote it through in our lame duck session so that's it fairly lame lame duck wanted to give you kind of the download on what's going on and when to expect transition and um, we are here for you. And with that, I'm going to bring Liz on camera. Uh, not on a Friday. We are <laughs> Thursday. I think it's Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Um, the days are blending. Yeah. 
I know we're totally throwing people off schedule, but like I said, this was something that we felt like it's been a while. We've missed you, everybody who watches these, and we wanted to check in and provide an update. Um, so with that, friendly reminder, if you have a question, we're going to open it up to Q&A. Please make sure you type your full name if that is not visible by your username. Um, and please post the city that you live in if you're asking a question so that we can make sure to get to our constituents first. Liz, do we have any questions this week? Yeah, we have one question so far. Hopefully we get a couple more. Um, but the first question is from Richard on Facebook. They ask, do you hope to work uh, as a senator long term? And then the second question is, do you think there should be term limits for all elected positions? Hey, Richard, it is a great and very timely question. Yeah, um, I really like this work. It has certainly been uh, a challenging first four years being in the minority. We've introduced a lot of legislation uh, that, that didn't pass, unfortunately, but we have been able to do a lot of really great work. And I'd love to continue it. So Michigan, uh, up until now, has had some of the strictest term limits in the country for state legislators. Legislators had been eligible to serve three two-year terms in the state house and two four-year terms in the state senate, and then you're termed out which on its face sounds like a great idea, but what we've seen happen, particularly in Lansing, is very heavy and high turnover of legislators where you lose institutional memory, you've got a lot of new people coming in, um, and it gave lobbyists and lobby corps a lot of influence over what moved and what didn't move in the state legislature. So we, in, we voted on Prop 1, just this election, uh, that would modify our term limits. So rather than the strict term limits in one chamber and then the other chamber, Michigan's term limits are now a total of 12 years that a legislator can serve them however they want. So you can serve out that entire time in the state house, you can serve out that entire time in the state senate. Uh, so I am going into my second term, which would have been my final term, uh, but potentially eligible for a third one. But then certainly after that, legally, uh, I will be looking for a new job. Okay, I don't see another question. Oh, here's one. Um, Renee on Facebook says, hi, Mallory. The Senate just passed the Marriage Protection Act. Why is it that some states, including Michigan, can still deny LGBT couples the right to be married from Ferndale? A future constituent. <laughs> Renee, hello. Hello, future constituent. Yeah, this is, you know, it was one of those things that was good news and also, you know, kind of bittersweet news. So the Marriage Equality Act on the federal level, really exciting that that passed. And I think the... Um, how much we've seen public opinion on marriage equality change on the federal level over a relatively short time uh, is really heartwarming to see. But to your point, state law um, currently bans uh, gay marriage in, in Michigan and the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act does not explicitly protect members of the LGBTQ community from discrimination. So that is something that uh, I know my colleagues and I have been working on for a long time. State Senator Jeremy Moss, who is our only openly gay state senator, uh, has been a champion on these issues for a long time. And with a new Democratic majority, it's something that we are all looking forward to working on to, to make sure that we're on the right side of history once and for all. I was just typing, we got a lot of questions after I, I asked for some. Um, <laughs> Marsha from Facebook um, asked, any update on the railroad bill? I think it's probably a federal one that I'm aware of. Okay, Marsha, um, <laughs> we would need some more detail. So if you would want to follow up with a specific bill number, if you don't know, or if you, if you want to email our office to ask specifically, there are, and I kid you not, thousands of bills that move through the legislature every single year. Uh, I know a lot of them offhand, but if there's a specific bill, we are more than happy to look it up um, and make sure you've got an, an accurate kind of update on where things are at. Sorry, I think I just put a glitch in there. I'm trying to figure out the questions. Um, the next one we have is from Julia on Facebook, um, talking about the auto no fault bill that passed back in 2019. I was wondering if there's any fixes or any changes that will be happening to uh, um, combat some of the consequences that came with that fix. 
Absolutely. Uh, so I was one of four senators to actually vote against the 2019 auto no fault reform bill. Uh, for the past four years, I've served on the insurance and banking committee. And, you know, I was really worried at the time that SB1, uh, which is now the auto no fault reform was pushed through that there were going to be a lot of unintended consequences, um, particularly for those who are already impacted. Uh, and we've seen that happen. And it's just devastating to see people losing the care that they've paid into that they rightfully deserve. And then on top of that, the cost savings that were promised really aren't there. And we're already starting to see insurance uh, companies raise their rates even above uh, what they were before the reform went through. So there had been bar bipartisan interest and in bills that we'd been working on to reform auto no fault. Uh, the current majority leadership blocked those bills from moving forward. Uh, so it is very much my hope and my optimism, and I'm very confident that we will see uh, fixed legislation moving forward in the new term. Uh, can't guarantee when exactly, but I know that it's something that there's a lot of support for. Um, and then I believe this might be a follow-up to the LGBTQ conversation from Rochelle on, on Facebook. Wants to know if there's a chance that any legislation will be introduced on this topic, I think possibly like Elliot Larson or what? Um, Absolutely. Other... Yes. Yeah. Uh, so for those who don't know, um, every time a term ends, all of the bills that have been introduced actually expire. So I've introduced, I, I think, around 40 bills over the past four years. Come December 31st, all of those bills become ghost bills. So they expire, they go away. Um, so all new legislation has to be reintroduced starting with a new term. Uh, each of us as individual members, we have a limit on the number of bills that we can request on any given time. So as a caucus, we are currently discussing internally, you know, what our legislative priorities, our calendars are so that we can begin to request those bills, get them ready to go in January. Um, but yes, I can almost 100% guarantee that you will see legislation introduced to address those issues. Um, and then the last one, see, let's see a question, but it's just from, um, Brandon Colo on Facebook. Um, hey, Brandon. Who you, you know, the hey, Royal, Brandon. yeah, <laughs> um, said, just looking forward to working with you on um, EV projects in the future. That's so exciting. I'm working, looking forward to that too. Um, yeah. It is a really, really exciting time in Michigan for the auto industry uh, outside of the legislature. I also uh, serve, the governor appointed me to the state's council on future mobility and electrification. Uh, we've introduced legislation related to EVs and charging infrastructure that unfortunately has not gone anywhere over the past four years, but with a new majority and a new term, we've got a lot of good work to look forward to and, and I'm looking forward to it too, Brandon. And then we just got an update from Marsha about the railroad. It said it's the bill the House just passed that hopefully avoids a railroad strike. I know there is um, only about a week. It's a federal bill. Okay. Oh, it's, got it. it. Um, um, and I see, I see. Yeah. My name is pronounced Marcia. Hi, Marcia. Marcia. Um, yes. Sorry, I didn't we, get to that part. Yeah. yeah great question. Uh, we as state legislators don't have any oversight over federal bills. Uh, but we're happy to. And one thing that we always do, and this is for everybody watching, for our constituents, if you feel very strongly about federal legislation, if there's something you would like our help advocating for, we've got a good relationship with our federal colleagues in Congress and the U.S. Senate. So we're always you know, pleased to pass um, your messages on forward to encourage our federal colleagues to take action. But unfortunately, uh, it is out of my purview. So I don't have any insight other than what you may have heard on the news about the railroad bill. Um, but I am very much hoping uh, that that a deal can be struck to avoid a strike and to give workers sick leave. I mean, just the basics of showing up to a job and being able to take sick time off when you need it uh, seems very necessary to me. Um, Carla on YouTube, which we don't get too many YouTube comments. What, what? YouTube? <laughs> um, says, does any statewide legislation exist that are similar to the Equality Act? Yes, um, certainly. I mean, we've got a lot of legislation that goes under different names, but I mean, mm -hmm. a, again, a huge focus for us has been on LGBTQ equality, gender equality. There's a lot of legislation that we have introduced 
um, that I have introduced, that many of my colleagues have introduced over the past four years uh, that we unfortunately have not been able to pass. But absolutely, you know, especially as we see the intersection of federal law and state law, um, you know, a good example of that that we've seen over the past year. Well, not a good example, but we've seen firsthand how important the interaction of federal and state is with the Dobbs decision. So when Roe fell, that really kicked the authority on abortion and reproductive rights down to the states. And we've seen that play out um, huge. So sometimes even when there is a federal law, we've got to make sure that state law aligns with it. And that's going to be something that's important to us as a caucus is making sure that all of our residents no matter who you are, no matter who you love, no matter how you identify, are safe and protected and welcome here in Michigan. All right, those are all the questions I see. They came in really rapidly <laughs> towards the end. So those are all the ones that I, I see now. Oh, cool. Well, um, excellent. Liz, thank you. Thank you for hopping on really quickly. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Exciting plans for the weekend. Um, it's my friend Danny's birthday, so we're going down. Um, I'm going down to Detroit to help celebrate, you know. <laughs> Happy birthday, Danny. <laughs> I'm going to send right. this. He's going to love it. There you go. Just watch, <laughs> watch the end of the live stream. It's going to be great. <laughs> Bye, Liz. Perfect. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, it was really cool to see questions from Facebook and YouTube. I have no idea if this actually streamed on LinkedIn, but um, if you're over on LinkedIn, hello. Glad you could join. We will be getting back to our regularly scheduled program when the new year turns over. Uh, January 11th will be the first Senate session day of the year. It's also a really exciting day because we have ceremonial swearing in. We've got all new members coming in. Uh, and then we try to do these just about every week that the Senate is in session. Michigan is a year-round legislature. Uh, there are spring breaks and summer breaks when we're in our districts, but stay tuned. It's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to uh, taking on a new role in the majority. Uh, it's been 40 years since Democrats have had a majority in the state Senate and a lot of work to do, a lot of possibility uh, in the work begun. So thank you everybody for tuning in. I hope you have a very safe holidays. Spend it with friends and family and loved ones, and we'll see you in the new year.